Hello there, and welcome to Controversies in Church History. My name is Derek Taylor. I am the host for this podcast in which we tackle the big questions in the history of the Roman Catholic Church throughout its history, very long history, all the persons, peoples, people, events, and ideas that have uh, made it uh, a controversial uh, institution. And I uh, just want to welcome you all uh, again, uh, listeners of the podcast. Thank you guys. Thank all of you for listening. Uh, thank you guys who've subscribed. Really appreciate it. Please, if you haven't already, check out uh, Controversies in Church History on multiple platforms, Facebook page. Please go and like. Um, check us out on the web, churchcontroversies.com. I have stuff on there besides uh, links to the actual podcast. Podcasts are available, um, hosted through Anchor, but also on Spotify, iTunes, or I guess it's Apple Podcast. I keep calling it iTunes. It's Apple Podcast, I guess. But most of the major places you will find uh, your favorite podcast. And yes, if you're just listening for the first time, it is free. It's a free podcast, so please check it out. Um, thank everyone again. Um, coming back at you with a new episode uh, this week. And this week, the, um, the, uh, the subject is going to be Catholic integral integralism. Sort of subject has been in the news. I give this the title, uh, Much Ado About Integralism, because if you are part of a very small <laughs> online, online Catholic world, especially if you're on the conservative or traditionalist side, you probably know what that term is. It's been sort of, um, well, we'll get to this in a moment, but it's become a sort of controversial thing in Catholic circles. And there have been people calling themselves integralists who are, you know, uh, taking positions uh, on things like especially church-state relations and religious liberty that upset some people, uh, even some people who are otherwise conservative-minded Catholics. So I thought I'd do a, a podcast on this. And we'll talk about a little about what integralism is, but also about its background, its history, where it comes from, why it's, it's a little bit controversial the way it is, so... Let me start out by giving my, this is my definition. You'll get different things. I'll, I'll point you to resources where you can go to learn about this if you want to. But um, integralism is just the idea that, um, well, the church should teach Catholic truth, Catholic, Catholic teaching in its entirety, in its integrity, hence integral, integralism. And um, specifically, more specifically, it goes back to a couple of different groups, which we'll get to in this the, the course of this podcast. One, a sort of anti-liberal group of Catholics in ooh, late 19th century Spain, but also in early 20th century in France, um, specifically the anti-modernist writers, mostly in France during the early part of the 20th century, so 1900 to 1914 or so. And um, the key things to note about this, about integralism, is one, it tends to, it, it tends to, be very aggressively opposed to the, whatever you want to call it, modern, modernist, liberal, progressive, I don't, I'm not being specific here because that's kind of all over the map here, but that modern tendency to deny or downplay aspects of the faith. And you know what I'm talking about. This is the whole, you probably heard the phrase, I don't remember where it came from, the whole uh, seamless garment idea. If you're an American, if you listen to this podcast, Cardinal Joseph Bernadine back in the 1960s, the idea that we shouldn't push opposition to abortion too much because really the church's social teaching was a, you know, a, a seamless garment made of many different threads, and so you don't want to emphasize one too much, et cetera, et cetera. It was a way of downplaying opposition to abortion because it was unpopular. And so that's one of the things that integralists are really against. The other thing that they're really that really distinguishes them, these thinkers, is that they are focused very heavily on church state issues or issues of social order. And when I say this, I actually probably one other thing about this is that they're as you're gonna see, there today there are a couple of groups who might call themselves integralists, and I'll get to this in a moment. Um One's more theologically inclined, the other's more politically inclined, <laughs> and we'll get to the difference. This is kind of an important, uh, important distinction. But I want to go through a couple of things here about what integralists, as far as I understand them, believe about things like church-state relations, religious freedom. Now, if you've listened to my podcast, which you probably haven't long enough, I've done, a, I've actually done an episode on Dignitatis Humanae. The Church's uh, the, the Declaration on Religious Freedom issued by the Second Vatican Council. So I'm not going to go into too much into that my view of that here today. I'm describing theirs as best as I understand it. 
And so um, one of the things integralists are known for is for insisting on the church's rights in society, meaning that they think the state should support the church. And so I want to go through why they believe this here and how that relates to religious freedom and everything. And this, these are the things, that, at least I, I understand the, the stuff I've read I'm say, uh, that they're saying. The first thing about this is the reason why, and by the way, they're not making this up. They get this from <laughs> lots of documents. In fact, late 19th century, uh, again, I went over this in Dignitatis Humanae, uh, Leo the Thirteenth wrote many encyclicals on this, and so they're basing a lot of their ideas on his and other people's uh, writings. But their idea basically is that Catholicism is true. The Catholic Church is the true faith. It will get you to salvation. No other religion will. And because of that, the church has to have some influence on society. Now, they combine that idea with some other ideas that, um, I want to get into the background too much here, but they basically, they're not talking about, uh, some people, again, accuse these thinkers of theocracy or wanting to establish a theocracy. They don't believe this. Um, they believe in uh, what's sometimes called the theory of the two powers, the idea that, um, or the theory of the perfect society, if you know what this is. So there are two powers, according to, um, or, or two societies that are created on earth by God. The church, the, temp the spiritual authority, and the temporal authority, the state, the civic authority. And they are both perfectly suited to fulfill their ends. Now, of course, to a theologian, to a Christian, your, your, your superior end is, of course, your destiny to, you know, uh, to be to live in eternity with God, right? So, and there, and this this integralist thinking, the temporal end should be subordinate to the spiritual, since that's humanity's ultimate aim, salvation. This doesn't mean, by the way, the church has to sort of govern everything or do it. it doesn't have to. It doesn't really have to. Uh, it shouldn't actually interfere too much uh, in the temporal end, except where it crosses over into the spiritual, which is always a problem. But the temporal should be the, the the state should be subordinate effectively, ultimately to the church, subject to its authority. And because of that, this is where the, uh, the the church deserves to have legal social privileges over other religions. Again, churches churches faith is true; the others are not. Doesn't mean they're all all they're all false. They're completely false, but they won't get you to salvation. Now, that's one of the consequences. This is one of the more controversial things about integralism. But there's a reason for this. Um, a couple of things I should mention. They mentioned this partly, of course, to protect the true faith, right? That's the idea. One of the things that if you uh, read, you know, again, the encyclicals of Leo the Thirteenth, a good place to start, um, there are limited limits to those privileges. Um, there is nothing in, nothing actually, in the theological tradition of the church that says the state has to suppress false religions. Even in a 99.9% a, a, a Catholic state, and they have a few minorities, there's nothing that requires that. So it doesn't flow from the fact that the church is the true religion, deserves to have certain privileges, that they have to go attack or suppress false religions. The state cannot, of course, violate things like natural law in pursuit of defending the true religion. It can't di violate divine law, right? And one of the things, that, one of the emphases you'll get from some of these thinkers um, to support what they're saying is that because again sometimes you get the the natural criticism will be well this is this is just theocracy right you're just doing this uh because you want power over other you know uh or you want to harm other you know religious minorities or something like this and uh one of the points that they make and they're right about this by the way is that basically all states all societies try to control beliefs that are incompatible with the majority or with the dominant beliefs in society um, in a strict sense, no state, no society is really absolutely pluralist in the sense they treat all beliefs equally. Some beliefs are treated superior to others. Uh, and this is, again, this is one of the re uh, things that, you know, people, because what they're essentially saying is that when they say the state should support the church, um, they're not saying the church, the state has to use coercive power to support the church. They're saying it can. Uh, and that's, again, where they get people that that's controversial, obviously, in uh, modern-day thinking. And um, they would point out, I think most of them have, the ones that I've looked at, and I'll get to some names in a minute But at the end of this, but basically their idea is that the state in a Catholic society would have, it was, if it was like a you know, mostly Catholic state and everything, most people were Catholics, has the same right as other societies or states to promote their own beliefs. Um one of these thinkers, uh, Thomas Pink, uh, is a philosopher, 
has made this point eloquently. I'll, I'll, I'll quote from one of his uh, writings here. It gives you a good, a good idea of this. He says, quote, political communities, no matter how ostensibly liberal they proclaim themselves to be, may well not prove that tolerant for any length of time in of general uh, length of time of genuine genuine pluralism of opinion about the morality of the family structure. In many contemporary universities, it is no easier now publicly to defend marriage as traditionally conceived than once it would have been publicly to defend same-sex marriage. The modern Western state may refrain from law from overtly addressing religious belief. Um, but in reality, the political elite will cooperate with its colleagues within civil society to foster and enforce a community of substantial, substantive, uh, substantive ethical belief. This is normal political functioning, even within a liberal culture, unquote. And he goes on to give an example of that, by the way. Um, the example is racism. Uh, if you haven't noticed, most societies in human history are perfectly fine with racism. <laughs> It's only the modern Western society, but they take it deadly seriously. And of course, in the modern West, you, that's the big obsession these days. So the Catholic state and, and people like Thomas Pink's thought is not any different in this idea. And one of the things that I think sometimes people, they react badly to this is they have this idea that, I think they have this idea, this is me talking, is that because the church is divine, it has to be some sort of voluntary association. It has to dispense with coercion altogether. Which is true, by the way. Coercion is always dangerous. Always, always a dangerous thing to coerce people. Um, because it might fight back and cause a lot of problems. There's lots of... Coercion is a, a double-edged sword. But quite honestly, I think it's a pretty... I don't think that idea holds up very well. No real society can exist without some level of coercion. The church is a real society. It is. In any case, there are lots of crit we'll come back to this. There are criticisms. That's the basic. That's a lot of stuff I just went through, but I wanted to make sure and get all that out of the way before we got into the history of this, because this doesn't come out of nowhere. Um, because in fact, this idea and the way it's put forward uh, really goes back to the 19th century. I just did a whole series a couple of months ago, finished up on Catholic liberalism, and talked about the. The threat from modern, you know, liberal states in the 19th century. Excuse me. And it's basically, in that, 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 in that series, I, m I mentioned at the very beginning of it, I wouldn't talk about anti, there were anti-liberal movements. Well, integrism, integralism, it's called two different things in different languages. This is the first thing they mention here. If you're American, this is all alien to you, <laughs> for the most part, because this is a European phenomenon. Um, it, it's called integralism. It's also called integrism, <laughs> integrism uh, in uh, French. Uh, or all actually, and this is the origins that actually come from Spain in the late 19th century, in response to Spanish liberals, you know, who wanted to get the church out of public life, all that other stuff. Sometimes I, again, listen to my series on liberalism. They, these states could be violently opposed <laughs> uh, to the church, take their property, expel religious order, stuff like that. In response to this, in Spain, there, removed, there emerged a movement and a brand of thought called traditionalism, which called for a return to Spain's medieval. Uh, traditions of government um, and you know, subordination to the church, among other things. And um, it was a lie with a political movement called Carlism. Uh, this is after the, this is a movement to try to restore a, what they thought of as a legitimate monarchy to Spain, a legitimate being not liberal, <laughs> basically. Uh, and it was focused on a man named Don Carlos, who was their uh, heir apparent to this, this movement. Because there had been a, rev a revolution in 1868, a liberal revolution, which had, again, disestablished the church, legally speaking, and granted religious freedom, religious freedom to minorities. Um, but it collapsed in 1874. And um, what happened is a group of people sort of became leaders of this traditionalist movement, particularly two people, a guy named Candido Nocadal and his son, Ramon Nocadal, who had been former moderates, They'd been moderate in, in political sense, Catholics, not necessarily totally opposed to liberalism, who'd become radicalized by that revolution. And from the 1870s onward, 1874 onward, they become really aggressive in attacking not just liberals, but other Catholics who sought any sort of compromise with the restored monarchy because they thought it wasn't traditional enough. And um, crucially, his son Ramon founded a newspaper called Siglo Futura in 1875. It became the sort of organ of this movement. <clears throat> and they began, basically, over the next few years, attacking, well, attacking not only other Catholics, but attacking the hierarchy in Spain. 
for their perceived, you know, compromises, their perceived weakness against liberalism. In 1881, the Nokadals organized a pilgrimage to Rome, the idea being that you're going to get people to go to Rome and, you know, submit to the Holy Father, all that stuff, right? But it soon became clear that the Nokadals were using this uh, to further their political aims in Spain, and so Leo XIII issued an order stopping it, said, no, <laughs> don't do it, basically, because Leo XIII was trying to keep the peace amongst Catholics in these countries. Uh, and the Nokadals, again, I mentioned before, they would attack the Spanish bishops for sort of any compromise they might make with the government. Uh, they even went so far as one point publicly to attack the papal nuncio to Spain, papal, you know, uh, representative in Spain. Um, eventually, they actually broke with um, the Carlist party, the Carlist party, you know, the supporter of the uh, of the, the legit, legitimate Kenme, the guy they thought was a legitimate uh, heir to the throne there in uh, in Spain. Uh, when Don Carlos in 1888 demanded basically total submission to his own authority, uh, and so and uh, by this time uh, the elder had died, but Ramon, Ramon Nocadal, the leader of this movement, traditionalist movement, refused, and they were actually expelled from this traditionalist party, basically. And um, and it's important here, by the way, not just to note how radical these people were. Um, the second thing to note here is that they had a disagreement is that these, and they were called integrists, um, anglicizing it in, in Spanish, but they thought that Catholic principles of society and social order were fundamental. While Don Carlos was, because they're at this point, uh, Don Carlos is, is not in power. He, they're talking about what would happen if they got back into power. And Don Carlos wanted, wanted to sort of leave political arrangements to be, to be determined later by a meeting of the Cortes, that's the Spanish parliament. And I mention this because it's really crucial to understand these integralists. They are mostly monarchists, but it's not the tipping point for them. Um, Nogadal himself says at one point that he's actually a monarchist, but he doesn't care. Um, he said he would accept any form of government that followed what they thought of as being traditional Catholic social principles. Uh, and so anything that deviated from that was considered to be literally a sin in some ways. And I should note about this, I've mentioned these two guys, the two Nokadals, because there's a real strong lay component to this movement um, of um, integralism. But they also had in Spain in the 1880s and 90s a, a real following among the clergy, lower clergy, I should say, not the bishops whom they didn't get along with. Uh, one of these lower clergy, a priest named Felix Sarda y Salvani, published a book in 1884 called Liberalism as a Sin. And this would become a standard text among Spanish integralists. Uh, it sort of, um, obviously the title kind of gives it away, but he was totally opposed to any sort of compromise with Catholicism. Um, he almost, they almost sort of hated liberal Catholics more than actual secular liberals because they thought of them as sort of being like traitors. Uh, but he makes the same points I've mentioned already in that book and other, elsewhere, that... <clears throat> um, the fullness of Catholic teaching had to be uh, uh, insisted upon. He also saw uh, saw uh, saw the fullness of Catholic teaching as sort of a moral thing. It's sort of like you're immoral if you basically fall short of any of these sort of ideals being or an ideal any of these principles being realized perfectly. Uh, in particular, again, issues of church, state, and church you know social relations. Uh, Christ is King of the universe, and so has rights in society, and these need to be recognized by the state and insist upon by law, the church has a right to demand them. That's basically um, the upshot of, of, of um, Sarda's uh, teaching. But what made the book, the book was really controversial. It was controversial because it condemned anybody who deviated from their line, basically as being, and I'm I, I, this is almost a direct quote, being enemies of God, <laughs> who deserve no charity or moderation. Be they secular liberals, be they Catholics, they don't deserve any, essentially. Uh, he tried to publish initially, and two bishops refused to publish the book. And then later on in 1887, um, an accusation was actually brought before him, before the Holy Office in 1887, in which um, the Holy Office basically said that the principles of the book were fine. However, let me find the quotation. It's a good quotation because it illustrates, uh, again, some of the, the dynamics here. Um. Uh, what it illustrates is that, uh, this is quote, we're talking about the book, uh, the general principles of the doctrine explained by Senor Sarda in clear and orderly fashion according to the teachings of the church. Basically, we're a good thing. But it goes on, quote, um, some incident incidental propositions perhaps contained there 
uh, which looked at the concrete order of things or to the state of political affairs in Spain, unquote, are, aren't quite as <laughs> aren't quite as uh, um, up to snuff. Um, it, it's a tactful because they didn't want to, they didn't want to come down and say the principles were wrong. They really aren't actually. Um, the integralists, uh, the claim they were making back then, and a lot of what they're making now is we're, we're just presenting Catholic teaching in its fullness. It's not wrong in principle. It basically is the right principles, but, but, but um, the actual texts are really powerfully divisive. And in fact, later on, the movement dies out by the or 1900s in Spain because a lot of people realize you can't because they're they're coming like very close to like attacking the Pope, and this is a no no. And in fact, eventually, um, Sarda himself repents of his harshness towards other Catholics in, the, in public in the 1890s. So uh, a, a sort of virulent movement trying to sort of, you know, trying to assert the fullness of Catholic faith, but not do, doing it um, in the most um, charitable or maybe politically helpful way. The second sort of incarnation of this came about in France in, France, in the early 1900s. Um, I don't know for a fact that this term was used in imitation of the Spanish example, but I, I think it's almost certainly that they're doing this. Um, Catholic newspapers in the late 19th century carried news items from other countries across Europe, so probably probably just copying the name. Because I, I should mention, the term integralist was actually a slur thrown by their opponents in Spain, but in France, initially they take this as a, as a, as a, a term they, they use for themselves. And this initially ap uh, applies to uh, the, the sort of theological opponents of modernism. Uh, again, did, did a talk on modernism? Go back and listen to that if you want to know my opinion on that. But um, people, theologians like uh, Gergo de Grange, Louis Bio, others like that, um, distinguished theologians, by the way, uh, who opposed the modernist, um, uh, the modernist threat. But also um, something, uh, a, a network of people, what came to be called the Seloditium, uh, which was led by a uh, Monsignor who worked in the Vatican named Umberto, Umberto Benigni. Uh, and again, not a layman, but a, a sort of non, I say it's not a theologian, but not uh, primarily a thinker, more of an activist, who actually creates a network of anti-modernist, there's only one way to put this, anti-modernist spies, uh, throughout Europe, like in France and Italy and Spain and other places, who, uh, after the modernist crisis is over, they'll spy on teachers in seminaries in Catholic universities if they exhibit in their lectures or in their writings any modernist tendencies. They were very controversial, uh, and in fact, they disbanded uh, in 1921. They actually get mentioned, uh, at least we think they get mentioned, uh, by Pope Benedict, Benedict XV in 1914, because Pope Benedict um, wrote an encyclical at the beginning of World War I calling for peace in the world, but calling, calling for peace among Catholics. And in fact, in one of the, and mostly, by the way, it, it, also, it also, you know, condemns modernism as, as his predecessor had, by St. Pius X. But he also, there's one paragraph, I think it's paragraph 24, in which he basically says that the name of Catholic is sufficient to denominate us, and we don't need any other names beside that. We think I think that that may refer to people who were calling themselves integral Catholics at that point in France, and this is probably a reference to them and to the Saladitium's activities. Now, so what happens is things begin to change as you get to the next era, the 1920s and 30s. This has to do with politics in France, and uh, what happens is, in the early 20th century, many Catholics flocked to the banner of a man named Charles Marat, who was an atheist, uh, but also a right-wing politician, who created a party and a movement called L'Action Française, French Action. And um, it was he's basically a modern nationalist. He took the nation to be the basic unit of, of, of life and of social order. Uh and yet he wooed Catholics, even though he wasn't he wasn't Catholic himself. He wooed Catholics and monarchists to his to his cause. <clears throat> and so he was not. And what that means, by the way, is not that the you know, Catholic integralism means the church should be the ultimate authority. He thought more or less the nation was. And so sometimes his thought is referred to as integral nationalism, right? Um, Integralism can be applied to different things, basically is what I'm saying. And these were very much, it was very much a modern sort of social creed he had. Uh, it was influenced by things like positivism, if you know the thought of Auguste Comte. Um, <clears throat> Marat's thought drew on that a lot. And in fact, 
um, L'Action Française was condemned. Pius XI in 1926 issued an encyclical condemning his teaching and ordering Catholics to sever any ties with, with L'Action Française. Um, and I, I mention this because there were a lot of people since then who have tried to connect Charles Morat and because basically Charles Morat is sort of a proto-fascist. That's what he was, effectively. Um, but there's actually literal, there's no real, there's not really any connection between them. Uh, in fact, uh, not only Pius XI condemned them, a lot of the integral, uh, Catholic integralists, the guys who deposed the modernists, also condemned them. Louis Billot was uh, um, uh, actually f- was friends with Charles Morat, but he condemned his ideas. So, uh, and this is part of the c- c- confusion over the use of that word integralism, which can describe secular movements, but also religious ones like the Catholic version. And they were, by the way, Morat's um, secular idea was copied by uh, in places like Brazil in the later decades. And in fact, you did have people, um, <clears throat> um, you did have some people who were Catholics who were still interested in this idea of integralism. In fact, one of the uh, initial supporters before it was condemned of of uh, L'Action Française, of Morat, was actually Jacques Maritain. If you know who Jacques Maritain is, he's actually famous kind of infamous among traditionalist Catholics because he was he, he promoted something later on which what that he called integral humanism. Um uh, he basically he basically came to uh, embrace the idea of separation of church and state. Um but his ideas ultimately were still kind of integral. He instantly thought the reason why the why the church wanted to why he embraced separation of church and state is because he thought that if it did that, the church could then exercise its authority indirectly. And he was still drawing on essentially medieval ideas of church-state relations. And there were others that were on the right, more on the right, people like Jean Madiron, who's a, he's not only a um, uh, Catholic integralist, he was an, uh, a traditionalist in the sense he was one of the supporters of the, uh, of the Latin Mass to try to save it after Vatican II. But these are minority. Most of these Catholic integralists never really were associated with Morat or his, um, or his group. What happened to get them associated was French politics. In 1926, um, shortly after uh, the condemnation of L'Action uh, uh, Française, um, a French politician, a Catholic, uh, a Catholic Democrat, Catholic Democrat is basically a sort of centrist to leftist, relatively speaking, <clears throat> politician in European circles. And uh, he published a book linking uh, Catholic integralism with Morat's movement. And in France, that accusation would become a real popular weapon with which to bash, not just integralists, but anybody on the right following World War II. Um, I'll, I'm going to do a series on this eventually, but um, the group of theologians who were given the term Nouvelle Theologie in the 1940s and 50s, <coughs> um, theologians who would influence Vatican II in a big way, used that term, integralists, uh, to tar their critics People like Gergo Lagrange and the neo-scholastic thinkers of the 1940s and 50s, to tar them with that idea. But cut why? Because they want implicitly, and some people still do this, to try to tie them implicitly with, say, the uh, the Vichy regime uh, in France during the, the World War II. If you don't know the Vichy regime, remember uh, Germany conquers France, half of it's under direct Nazi occupation, the other half is ruled by a puppet government led by a uh, former French general named Vichy. And um, it's, by the way, there's not there's no evidence for that for the most part. These these uh, scholastic thinkers didn't have anything to do with Vichy, but it became a popular weapon, rhetorical weapon, right? It was also used against opponents of Dignitatis Humanae after Vatican II. Um, most famously, Marcel Lefebvre. Um, he and his followers have been accused of being, you know. You know, uh, followers of Morat, Laxian Francaise, and fascist, and there's just not much evidence of it. Yeah, there've been a few followers here and there, but the well, the Fed had nothing to do with Laxian Francaise. Uh, and I can say this: I, I, uh, there's really no connection. Uh, and you'll get this a lot, actually. And, and you're going to have, even after, uh, well, after, well, in the 1940s, but also after Vatican II, some defenses of integralism. Um, two I'll mention in particular. One was by an American theologian. Joseph Clifford Fenton who was a student of uh, Gerger Lagrange. <coughs> um, he famously became an opponent of John Courtney Murray, the Jesuit theologian, who was one of the people responsible for drafting Dignitatis Humanae at Vatican II. And Fenton argued against 
you know, in the 1950s, strenuously against Murray because Murray wanted to make the sort of American settlement of, of religious freedom, the sort of ideal of Catholic thinking. And Fenton said, you can't do this. Um, but Fenton made a similar point that was later on made about integralists as opposed to their opponents. That um, the philosopher Dietrich von Hildebrand made, 1973, um, if you don't know, Hill, von Hildebrand's a great German philosopher, was a, was a, he was a Lutheran, converted to Catholicism, uh, was an opponent of, of Hitler during World War II. And um, he makes the point most eloquently in his book, The Devastated Vineyard, that, and it's kind of funny, he talks about how he was um, in the book, uh, I'll read part of it here, because uh, it's important to note this, because uh, this, this is in the aftermath of Vatican II, right, when all hell's breaking loose and there's all this, this uh, sort of craziness goes, going on. But listen to what he says, this is worth uh, quoting him at length, because he's an intelligent observer of this. Quote, a short while ago, a well-known and important French theologian who deplores the present devastation of the vineyard of the Lord, reference to the post-Vatican II troubles, uh, I'm going on, quote, said to me that the integrists were just as bad as the modernists. According to him, the integralists who see everything which is not strictly Thomism or her uh, as heretical, um, um, and through their spiritual and intellectual narrowness, as great a danger as the progressives, uh, who want to introduce a pluralism to the Holy Church. This is what he says about that. And this is the thing I want to get here. Some people like to make that comparison. These integralists are just as bad as the modernists. This is what von Hildebrand says. He says, this is obviously a great error. The narrowness of the integrist may be regrettable, but it is not heretical. It is not incompatible with the teaching of the Holy Church. It views certain philosophical theses as inseparable from, separable from or orthodoxy, though they in no way are. Uh, but these the philosophical theses are in no, also in no way incompatible with Christian revelation. Um, yeah, and so what he's basically saying is, yet yeah, they may be doing harsh things. They're not not necessarily. They're not necessarily. Um, 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 they may have some abuses that are problematic, but nothing they're saying in principle is incompatible with the church's teaching, and. Um, and he goes on to say, look, most of these people are basically, I'm, I'm going to sum up the rest of it, um, it, it uh, basically is that there's no, there's no danger that they're going to destroy the faith, essentially. The danger lies on the other side. That's essentially the same, uh, the same uh, point that Fenton made a couple decades earlier. Uh, but effectively, that, that criticism squelched or destroyed integralism the first time. And what's happened in recent years is that this term has been sort of resurrected and this sort of position has been resurrected as far as i can tell basically by two sets of people uh one of whom is is kind of based in the united states and i don't know that i only know them vaguely i'm not going to go deep into their thinking for a variety of reasons but there's a sort of coterie of mostly politically conservative intellectuals writers you probably know the names. Um, Saurabh Amari, the convert, um, uh, the journalist. Um, Adrian Vermeule, who is a, uh, a very eminent legal scholar. Um, theologian Chad Pecknold. I have these names here. I'm trying to read them off. Uh, Patrick Deneen is, the again, another um, scholar. Uh, they've written books uh, decrying modern liberalism, and they've sort of embraced, I don't know if they've embraced all of this or fully all of this, but they've, they've raised the specter of integralism, and they've sort of brought this into the public sphere in American politics. Um, I'm not sure why they've done, <laughs> not done this, but they've done that. I, I, I really want to bring their faith into the public square, which is very, which is in principle, a noble thing, but they've, they've done this, and this is what gets people up in arms in America when they hear stuff like this because they're so unfamiliar with it. And, um, uh, and so that's one group of people. Other group of people that most people don't seem to know about, they're, they're much more, they're integral, they're, they're, they're more theologians, and they're really not concerned with what these people are talking about, and they're mostly not Americans. Uh, the people I'm thinking of, if you know, there's a website called the Josias uh, associated with um, well, several people, but the the uh, with a monk named Edmund Waldstein. I'm gonna butcher his name. Waldstein. Waldstein. I'm an American. Forgive me. Um, but um, they're much more. If you go to their website, you can get a sense of what they really think. And mostly, they're not even talking. They'll talk about like practical issues, but they're more concerned with principles. There are a few others. I mentioned Thomas Pink. 
Uh, there's, another, there's another Dominican named Thomas Crean. I think he's English. Maybe he might be American. I can't recall. I, I'm not totally familiar with their thought. Um, uh, who've again wanted to insist on, you know, again the church's, you know, the church's rights in society, right? And um, and so these are two different. I said this because these are really two different things. Is my point. Uh, I don't think. Well, let me talk about this. Is like because one of the controversial things here is people are like, especially in the Anglophone world. I've seen some Catholics online, other places. Like they really get freaked out by this. Like, oh my God, this is theocracy. This is tyranny. This is all this horrible thing. Um, I think some confusion arises here, partly because you do have people again in the United States who are involving this term in political polemics. Um, their opponents, of course, you know, want to tar them with fasc- the idea of being fascist. But I-, I think some of these, some of these people, again, I mentioned Sarah Amari. I'm not trying to pick on him, but Amari, I think he does it to sort of goad them. <laughs> you know, again, it's almost like a scare word. And this is again, this this goes back to the to the the um, to the Spaniards in the 19th century. They adopted that 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 term almost as a sort of you know. It's sort of an F you to your opponents. Like, yeah, we are scary. We're going to get you and stuff like that. I think that's what this is more than more than anything else for these political thinkers. <clears throat> um, and again, they've written some weird, they've written some things where I can see why people would be upset. I believe um, Adrian Vermeule wrote a, again, this gets into political stuff. I'm, I'm going to leave to one side. I'm more concerned with integralism as a Catholic thing rather than a political thing even though, again, they're not totally separable. But, uh, again, I don't think, I don't know, I, I don't really think much, I hate to say that, I don't, again, I don't think much of the political prospects of the American integralists on the right. I just, I, I think it's mostly, I hate to say it, it's mostly talk. <laughs> I think it's mostly rhetoric. I don't think they have a real political program. Or it's, it's, so, it's so, you know, abstract and in principle that... <laughs> Again, this is actually one part of the problem here uh, with integralism is that um, the church has this full range of teachings that yeah they're not really they're not really negotiable ultimately. On the other hand, it's a real problem. Okay, in certain societies, how to how to actually implement certain parts of them. And um, I should mention uh, one of the things that makes this kind of interesting to me. I just went through some of the overview of the historical background of all this is that. Both in the 19th, early 20th century and today, integralism seems to have a couple of features. One is that there's a serious involvement of the laity in this, um, especially in the press. Again, Amare is the sort of the person I mentioned here back in the 19th century, no Kandal. Uh, later on, you know, people like Maritain and Jean Maritain were, you know, laymen in France who were part of this. And, um, what's interesting is that, oh, the other thing that's interesting about this is that it goes along with, um, it kind of, I want to say hostility, but sort of uh, criticism of, well, official Catholic institutions um, against the perceived weakness of the hierarchy in defending the faith. Um, and there was some truth to this, by the way, in Spain in the 19th century. Um, I don't think there was as much truth to that as there is now. <laughs> There's a lot of truth to that now. That's one of the big differences between integralists, I think, in the 19th century and now, is I think there is a general problem with the hierarchy not defending the faith. Um, I also think in both cases, as far as I can tell, at least in their rhetoric, the lay contingent of integralism tends to be more radical than the theologian side of this. Um, uh, and so I think that's where you get some of these... Because, ten- again, they're not, they don't have, they're not as bound, uh, our, our laymen, by the same sort of level of obedience as uh, theologians or priests are. And um, again, there, and there's a tendency, especially among some, uh, and this was a tendency among the Spanish integralists in the 19th century, again, to sort of, you know, again, treat everybody as a traitor who didn't agree absolutely 100% with them on everything. And uh, you kind of see some of that, again, I mentioned, I don't want to mention too much, but some of these, again, American so-called integralists um, invoke um, not just Catholic, you know, thinkers like Leo XIII, They'll also invoke people like Carl Schmitt. If you don't know who Carl Schmitt was, he's a famous and influential legal scholar and political thinker. There were a bunch of famous books in the 1920s, then later on became really compromised because he, because he became briefly a member of the, uh, excuse me, the, of the Nazi Party in Germany. So he's a really controversial thinker. He's also really brilliant. 
And um, the most important, like his most imp- one of his most important contributions is his idea that politics is always reducible to the friend enemy distinction. That knowing whose side is who's on whose side is the most important thing. He thought all politics, Schmidt did, was based on this. And some of these, some of these thinkers, I think Amari's done this, Vermeule, others have done this, have taken up that sort of cry. In other words, um, they want to delineate the true believers from the false ones. Now, again, I, I think putting that in those terms is a little overheated. There's always true. It's always true. You need to make distinctions between true and false beliefs. The, the friend-enemy distinction can be really dangerous. Having said all that, um, the, the way they do this sometimes is regrettable, both not just the historical stuff I'm talking about in the 19th, early 20th century, but even uh, people right now. Um, the integrists, whether they're the theologians or the more, the, the more lay version of this, they're right about one thing, and that is you can't have people in positions of authority um, people in positions of authority in the church who don't believe fully everything the church teaches. <laughs> uh, if the last 50 years of the church's life have proved anything, they've proved that. <laughs> Personnel is policy. Uh, to me, that's what the, that's really the major thing that's been causing problems in the church for a long time. Our leaders don't seem to believe fully everything they're supposed to believe and defend, so they don't defend it. Um. And so that's one of the reasons. That's one of the reasons why they're they're kind of coming out in full force. That the 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 official institutions of the church have not done that. And so, when it's all said and done, uh, I'll sum this up for you. The basic principles of integral, integralism are, are correct. I think they're basically Catholic teaching. The problem is applying them in a modern setting, especially things like church-state relations and uh, things on religious freedom, are really complicated. That's the problem, right? Uh, that's what this is really about. How can the church live its faith out completely, the whole thing? Not only the easy parts of it. In a world that simply, a society that simply defines itself against so many of its teachings. And I think one of the things you, I take from all this uh, uh, is that it's a temptation to those who are frustrated with, quite frankly, the weakness of the church. Not just the weakness of its leaders, but its weakness as a, as a body, as an institution, to either convince very many people, uh, many, very many people of the truth of the gospel, or because it's weak, and there are people who hate the church, of having to suffer depredations that it can't avoid in societies like that. I think this leads a lot of people to seek bold, aggressive solutions to that. This is understandable. Um, and by the way, I should mention some other thing about that I noticed about the integralists, whether the 19th century or the 20th century or the 21st century. Uh, not one of them, not one, I don't think I've heard of one who was a woman. Every single one of them are male. A lot of them young males who, of course, are really aggressive and stupid and like to fight. <laughs> Uh, I'm not saying any, any integralists are stupid, but like they, young men are, is what I mean. But like younger male fight more. So that's another thing about it. And this is understandable because, of course, the other reaction to this state of affairs, which is it's, it's a dire state of affairs we live in, is is probably going to be something like despair. And um, I, I, I can honestly say, if it, even though just those two choices, yeah, bold, stupid action is probably better than despair. But it's a fact that the aggressiveness of some, not all, some integralists, I think, damages their cause. Another thing I think damages their cause, and I think they ought to, I think some of them had tried to uh, have addressed this, so not all of them, but some of them don't do this, is that I don't think they spend, I don't think they spend enough time trying to address the history of Catholic societies and Catholic states that have abused their power, especially over, you know, again, the thing that all moderns are, 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 are constantly carping about uh, minorities, right? Religious minorities, Jews, people like that. And one of the reasons they don't like doing this, by the way, is rhetorical. Again, this is because other liberal critics, other critics, secular critics, will use various, you know, cases where the church did abuse its power in the past, to argue that you know the church is inherently violent, it's inherently racist, it's inherently whatever, it's inherently fascist, whatever it is, and therefore can't be trusted, you know, at all. This is a, a false criticism. It's almost always raised in bad faith. However, however, 
if integralists, either the theologians or the people, lay people who are in the world, really want people to trust them, um, to really want people to trust the church with influence over society, with power over society, they should probably address how they might prevent those types of abuses from happening in the future. Um, no state or society can do this completely. They all abuse. All societies do things like that. And you can kind of see, you, you know that's that's been used against the church in really dishonest ways, if you're listening to this podcast. I won't belabor it. However, integralists as a whole don't seem terribly concerned about it. And I say this only because, again, if you basically effectively tell people you should give the church more power now, but we'll work out later about how we, how we deal with abuses. That's not going to be a very reassuring response to their to their to their concerns. So that's my criticism. In general, however, my 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 take on all this is I think from the most part the sort of fear mongering over integralism is really overblown. Um, in 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 um, in some, their principles are Catholic principles. Yes, they should be put into practice. Um. However, there's also very little real possibility that anyone listening to my podcast will ever see those practices, uh, ever see those principles in their fullness put into practice in their lifetimes. That's just where we're at in the modern Western world. And um, uh, again, I think, uh, again, um, I think the people pushing for this, especially uh, on the right in America, Again, I, th I think they're pretty much rhetoricians rather than real power brokers. They don't, they're not very, I don't think they're very good at actual politics is my point. If you're worried about it, you shouldn't be worried about it. Waste your time. Um, but you should take, if you, if you have problems with what the, in principle they're saying, you have problems with the Catholic faith, I think. You need to go read their stuff. Some of it makes, some of it's, it's not the sort of fire breathing crazy stuff you probably think it is if you've ever, if you, if you only hear the caricature of this stuff. Um, I'll mention the website's name again, the Josias. Again, it's actually not the most exciting stuff in the world, but they have stuff on there about these concerns. Uh, there was a book published. Tom Crean published a book a couple of years ago with another, another uh, theologian, uh, which I think was called, I think it's called Integralism. So it talk, goes through some of these issues. You may disagree, whatever, but like they are basically, there's nothing in Integralism that's incompatible with the Catholic faith. Uh, the applications of, of those principles are another matter. So that is my final word on that subject. Uh, thank you all for listening uh, if you, uh, my podcast. I really appreciate it as always. Again, um, like and subscribe on uh, like on uh, like us on Facebook. Subscribe to the podcast. Go and visit our website. Um, hopefully, I'll have um, well, I'll have some new stuff up on the, the the website as well on the blog and other things here in the next few weeks. Um, schedule going forward, probably one more one off episode. And then things are going to slow down. Uh, <laughs> if you don't know this podcast, I teach <laughs> at a college, a community college. So things will slow down during this middle of the semester. But I will, after that one last one-off episode, begin the next extended series, which will be on Latinization, uh, the Latinization of the Eastern churches, um, how the Roman Catholic Church has in times past either imposed its liturgical Latin practices on the Eastern churches or how they've adopted them. And so that'll be that coming in the fall. So look out, be on the lookout for that. And um, yeah, um, God bless you all. Thank you guys for listening. I appreciate it so much. And um, take care and have a great week, y'all. God bless.